Hello and welcome to session two of WordPress Multisite 201 with Tom Woodward. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm here with Tom, the one and only, and Taylor is also joining to provide some color and question commentary. Um, yeah, I'm here so, for the color commentary. <laughs> color commentary and keeping Tom on his toes. Um, so uh, today we are talking about customizing the onboarding experience for your WordPress multi-site. We're going to be talking about some pretty cool um, things that Tom has been working on to kind of make this work better for him and his environment. And maybe these are things that you can implement yourself at some point, or maybe they'll just get you thinking about what it is specifically in your environment that um, could use some tweaking and uh, you know, start researching what, what might work best for you. So um, with all of that said, uh, Tom, please take it away. All right. And if you could share my screen now, I think that would be, we'll just start right off. Uh, I'm going to try and stay a little more on task since Jim isn't here to, to help me wander far astray. <laughs> so we'll, we'll worry about time a bit more. Um, so uh, something that's happening more and more, I think, is is trying to get uh, that initial choice done between, say, a WordPress multi-site and a domain of one's own environment. And even if you don't have um, a domain of one's own and you're just doing WordPress multi-site, this first page where you're trying to explain people to people like, what are the opportunities here? What are we really doing in terms of support? Who would choose this and why? This is your front page, that landing, landing zone. So. Um, one of the things I've been kind of working on, and this is meant to get people started in that conversation. So it's a little plug-in that builds some content or in, around this idea of kind of finding your path and this choice. Now, I think Shannon at uh, University of Mary Washington really did a great job. And so you should definitely check out the way they're uh, kind of guiding people as well. I think she has a really good metaphor between an apartment building and a house. Um, that, that I think resonates in certain ways uh, really, really strongly. This one isn't quite uh, as, as visual in terms of that, but that idea of finding your path, showing these two different choices and trying to say who it's best for and what you provide in the different environments, trying to guide people to, if you just want WordPress fast and easy, you want the multi-site. If you want to explore, if you want choice more than technical support, maybe maybe domain of one own domain of one's own is is more of that path. But trying to get people to think about what they really want and choose accordingly. Um, one of the things I thought would be beneficial in this choice is being able to see the plugins and themes that you have on the multi-site. So that's one of the things this plugin does is it makes that stuff visible on the front end. And um, I tried to, to get some, some pros in here that's like, hey, we're almost uh, custom curating. These are bespoke chosen themes and plugins, you know, that are meant to serve most users. They're already vetted in terms of security, accessibility, and functionality. And they're going to answer most people's needs. Um, and then it just kind of lists what's available. So this stuff happens automatically um, via a plugin, fun stuff that's kind of been added in in case it was needed is they all have IDs. So if you wanted to blank out individual ones for any reason or highlight them in a particular way, um, you can do all that via CSS um, as, as you choose. So is so this, this dynamic is dynamic yeah. when you add more plugins yes. and themes, it will just automatically populate. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And let's. Just so is it, a, so yeah. is the mm -hmm. WordPress plugins available via like the API or something that you're able to query that or. Yeah, that's what this, uh, so this is what the plugin does. Um, in case uh, this is the plugins one. Uh, so it's just going through and, doing a little query where it gets all the plugins and then spits out this particular chunk of HTML. And it's tied to a plugin because I'm kind of old fashioned that way. I did not make it a Gutenberg block. Um, 
sorry, Ed and other people. <laughs> I might do it if the demand was really there, but this was just, you know, a simple, simple way. And since Gutenberg still supports um, short codes, um, that's what it does. And it's a very similar pattern with how it gets themes. You know, we have a function called get themes. We have a function in WordPress called get plugins. And those things are what gets us the data and then allows us to loop through it. And so this could be fancier in different ways. You know, in our case right now, um, I'm using it to build a just a, a big chunk of HTML that we spit out into the editor. Um, but that's live. You could, instead of doing that, have it generate a post and write the content there if you wanted to like customize the descriptors and didn't have a ton of content. Um, you know, you can start to think about the flexibility and fluidity of how this behaves, you know, once you realize, hey, I can get all this stuff and then I can do something with it. What that something is, you know, since we're in round two, the, 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 the more sophisticated level starts to become the stuff you decide what you want to do with. And you can see this plugin is basically just this. This is all the functional stuff is what, like 60 lines of code about. Mm -hmm. And it's already done for you to modify and tweak as you desire. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, not a bad one to start with, to mess around with as you start to understand what plugins do. Um, and, you know, even with 60 lines of code, look at a good 20 of them are just telling you what the plugin's name is pretty much um, and keeping bad people from accessing it directly. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a start. And I think like one of the conversations I'm hoping we have as part of this workshop series is like, what else would be helpful in terms of showing people what this does? Because you can see in my uh, development environment, this is embarrassingly large. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so like you wouldn't want to do this to users if you had this environment. One, you wouldn't want this environment. But, you know, one of the things I thought about was, oh, do we need a way to categorize and sort and search these things? That's or possible. See what's included by default versus, you know, what you have options to add. Right. Yeah. Network activated versus mm -hmm. individual choices. Um, right now it's pulling the descriptor from the actual plugin and from the actual theme and then linking uh, to whatever the plugin wants you to link to. And all of that is optional. These don't have to be links at all, you know, and maybe that's useless. You don't really want to send people out to the plugin page. Um, but that's all, all things you can change, all things you can think through as part of who are my people? What do I want them to experience? How do I keep this manageable and useful both to myself and to them? Because that's one of the reasons I just did this. I didn't think that I personally would keep up with like custom descriptions of the plugins and themes. Right. So I just use the default ones. You know, maybe if you have a constrained enough list, you do keep up with kind of your custom descriptions and you provide an avenue for writing them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, you know, you're, you're just looking at that balance of how much work is it for me? How much value do the people I'm trying to get interested get out of it and how do i manage that stuff like you know the worst scenario is you do a ton of work and nobody looks at it that's pretty much the story of most of my documentation <laughs> <laughs> you know i over document no one looks at it they ask the same questions anyway and um but you have something uh, to point them to <laughs> that's true and i think that's helps yeah. you in the long run right right Setting that cultural expectation is part of this game is going like, okay, I'm not gonna do this for them. I'm going to point them at the documentation. I'm going to do that regularly. I'm going to do it in a kind way, but in a consistent and firm yeah. way. 
And that may be a huge uh, cultural shift, depending on who you're dealing with. A lot of times students are used to it, but sometimes faculty, not so much. They're used to more of a white glove experience. So sure. how you navigate that depends on your institution and goals. But, you know, hopefully it's it's a good starter thing. So we'll have, I mean, this plugin is, is available already, but, you know, we'll, we'll link to it and it, generates this content, it has these little visuals for whatever they're worth, and it's just trying to paint that picture. WordPress, that's what this is. Choices around the technology, you know, we got JavaScript, we got HTML5, my SQL kind of taking a front, uh, front seat, and we're also referencing Omeka and Scalar uh, for the masochists among us. Um, and but, you know, it's trying to say like this is a little more complex. It's offering those things as maybe curiosity, um, you know, for whatever that's going to get you. And then these things become paths into whatever you're using for your um, registration, however you're thinking about that. So I think starting to paint that big picture, starting to create um you know what's this community feel like what are we trying to build in terms of not a brand necessarily but like what's our vibe what's our identity how are we trying to shape what people come to expect how they feel about the language and everything as we go through this so all right we're about 15 minutes in <laughs> that's the chooser um I thought we'd get kind of right into the registration process and things that we can take advantage of that are often left um, kind of alone. And these are right here in our general network settings. Let's take a look at a couple of the things. Um, you know, and I'll just note some of the easy stuff, but I promise we'll get more complex. One, I like registration notification. Um, I like to leave that on and I mm -hmm. have an email address for it. You may want a generic email address that's support for the site. I tend to encourage that because <laughs> like when you, somebody leaves and that email address is somebody's, mostly people will forget to change it. And it also makes it much harder to distribute that workload or the people who can view. So if you can get a generic or shared email address for these types of things, definitely use it. Highly encouraged, particularly in places with lots of turnover. Yeah. And eventually everybody leaves, you know? <laughs> yes. So like, you know, don't build that one point of content, right? Yeah. Or contact. Well, and especially um, if you have access to like a ticketing system, like if you're in an IT yeah. department or working alongside an IT department, um, a lot of those systems will let you do like a custom email that goes to a specific place and that's a really great way to do it. Make sure that emails don't get missed. Easy to see who's doing what, things like that. Otherwise, a shared inbox works okay too. But. Yes, absolutely. Or you might, if you use Slack, for instance, you can set an email address up for a channel and those things would just come into a channel in Slack. Um, so just keep thinking to yourself whenever any of these examples are given, what's my workflow? Where do I do the stuff? How does it fit into my organization? Um, so th there's little things here, like we talked about uh, setting your limited email registrations to particular domains, you can set multiple domains, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is the stuff that is often left alone, um, but has some abilities uh, that you might take advantage of. They are limited. Um, let's be clear there, and we'll see how we might escape some of those limits. So these are the emails that go out when people register. They say things like howdy by default. Maybe, maybe that fits your vibe. Maybe it doesn't. You know, WordPress back in the day was a little more um, fun feeling. You know, they had the Hello Dolly plugin by default. They had a bunch of kind of weird things that weird people do. And over time, it's gotten a little bit more um, businessy. But you can see there are vestiges of that stuff with things like Howdy um, and the Howdy up here, too. Mm -hmm. But 
you can customize this stuff. Notice I put in uh, HTML there. It will not work. <laughs> it will come out just saying H2. So even if you were to write the HTML in here, or do inline CSS, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. You have a set of variables. Um, you know, these are the main ones likely you would use, but you can put in certain variables into this um, and then customize it and save it. Also, we're pointing out that it's kind of a weird way to write the variable. So be careful that you don't uppercase right. <laughs> all caps yeah. things. It, are those all of the variables? Or is there a place where you can find more? Or There are more variables. I need to look into where that list of variables is. I'm sure it's probably documented somewhere. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm making note. I'm a note <laughs> with a pen. Um, see that I'm I'm uh, I use multiple modalities, but <laughs> customize this. Even if you're not going to do anything else, just tweak this a little bit. Make it sound more like you. Think about like what information really are people going to want and need to see here this is also a place sometimes where you can tweak things like if stuff's getting stuck in your institutional spam filter and you maybe struggle with getting things whitelisted sometimes changing uh variables here can help clean that up hmm. um so because a lot of times things like password come off feeling spammy hmm. and so you can change different aspects here and sometimes get through like if you don't have a you know an optimal uh <laughs> organizational relationship with your it group or prints perhaps like in some places i've been they don't even understand how the spam filter is working it mm -hmm. seems mm -hmm. so like uh those are things you can play around with and these are two different uh emails so uh the user and the welcome one so you know, just just change those. It's also a great place to include links to information too, right? Head off yes. some of those support requests by linking to a page where you've got resources or a video or something for folks to get started with. Um, great, really great place to put that. Don't put too much in there, otherwise people won't engage right. with it, and they still might not. But <laughs> um, it's a good good shot. So yeah. Um I guess I am curious, like, because of these limitations you're talking about, if you wanted to link to things um, that weren't those specific, that didn't fall into those specific short codes that are in there, um, would they hyperlink or you know, would you be able to do something like an embed or um, is that really just like not available? You, you won't be able to do any embeds. I think if you put like plain URLs in there, they should mm -hmm. be functional, but it depends a bit on the user's email and how they have some things set up, right. um, but probably functional links. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the bad side of that is like, you know, for accessibility reasons, you don't really want naked links because, right. you know, screen readers read it out a letter by letter, which is never pleasant for anyone. And that's probably a good opportunity, knowing that limitation in mind. Um, make a, a clean place or even a redirect. Like if you can get docs.stateu.org, so at, at least it's a naked link that isn't too, too long. Even if your stuff doesn't live there, but maybe it redirects to someplace else. There, there are a lot of ways to handle that. That's how I would do it. Make it a make it a short URL that's understandable when read out loud, uh, things like that. Um, not ideal, but way better than super long thing. Right. Great, great, great example too. And uh, I had not uh, hadn't thought about that. And now I have. And now I'm different from this experience. <laughs> uh, hopefully the same thing is going for people uh, listening now. Um, all right. And then the other piece which is often kind of just left alone which i think can be like a really good place to put useful stuff so right off the bat you have a first post first page and even first comment that is created on all these new sites activation even if you're not doing cloning or whatever usually people just throw all this stuff away right because it is just useless stuff well you know you can make it useful like you know 
do kind of some of the similar things that Taylor's mentioning. Like if you have valuable information that you send out uh, regarding support, regarding where tutorials live, build that into this process. And these things can be more robust um, and come across in the posts in ways that you can use embeds and that sort of stuff. So take advantage of that. It's a little bit of a pain to write them in this, uh, but you might consider also cutting and pasting the HTML if you're not comfortable with it from other, you know, from the visual editor um, and then just pasting it in here like that. So there's some opportunities here to make this content something that isn't just thrown away by default. And even if 80% uh, do throw it away without looking at it, that's a 20% gain from just giving them just plain garbage, right? So just keep thinking about that. All right. So that's the default stuff. Um, oh, one more thing I might do is uh, based on recent experience, I'm taking out anything that is video files from my allowed upload file types list, maybe even audio too. It may be worth the hassle in the communication um, <laughs> just to, just to avoid the storage issues. It would be worth exploring if you're unfamiliar with, if you're looking at this list right now, watching this video and be like, I don't know what some of those are. Google them. Um, cause, cause I like personally, I would leave MP3 because podcasting or like audio sharing was a big use case for me when supporting faculty and students, but I wouldn't keep wave because wave files are huge and that's also audio, but you know what I mean? Like, these right. decisions can, that stuff can actually matter in a meaningful way. And I would prefer to, keep, I always like to keep, catch those things technically when I can. It's like, look, if someone's trying to upload Wave and they put in a ticket and saying it doesn't work, this is my opportunity to show them how they can take, take that Wave file, make it an MP3, which is going to make things better for them in the long run. So, uh, or maybe you just want to allow it, you know, <laughs> whatever direction works for you. I think that's a, a, a perfect example. And the other thing you can start to look at as you explore like programmatically, what can I do is maybe, I think you can, um, you can do different errors on the attempt to upload different file types. So if you customize that and say, you know, you try and do an upload of a wave and instead of just saying not allowed, it says wave files aren't allowed because and then it says what you want to do is compress them like this and here's a link to our documentation on compressing wave files and so you have almost that automated cool. intercession at the point of issue and yeah. that's what we're looking for in lots of these things it's like how do we how do we take advantage of the fact that we documented it how do we take advantage of the fact that we know what someone is trying to do and kind of get those two things intersecting Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's a super pain. Um, but even if you have to do it manually based on a request, um, it's it's better than trying to undo. Like like I have to deal with a site right now that has, I don't know, maybe 20 different videos that they upload it in LinkedIn. So we got to migrate them to like uh, Panopto and then we have to replace them every place they're used in the site. And like that is going to take a lot of time and energy. And I would much rather have prevented that problem and dealt with the initial request around like, what's going on? I can't upload this or in a perfect world on video upload attempt tell them where to put the videos and right. then guide them at, you know, much better. So we have a, we have a continuum of awful, which is where a lot of my stuff is sometimes to optimal. And if we can get anywhere in between that, Hey, when, when, um, all right. So that's default registration stuff. I did want to take a little bit of a tour of, uh, what we might do in gravity forms. And as we're 27 minutes in, <laughs> I'm going to try and pick up the pace a little bit, but this is again, level two. So we're a little bit faster. We're a little bit, um, more experienced. Uh, so we will, uh, go faster. So gravity forms, let me show you which plugins are activated. So I have Gravity Forms regular activated, and I also have 
the Gravity Forms user registration add-on activated. So those are the two things turned on that will enable me to do this stuff. And we'll just take a look at an example of like doing user registration. Uh, so I have a form here called register user. I do encourage you to name these things really explicitly and well, because again, you will not always be there. People move on. Also, if you're anything like me, you might not get back to this for months or years. And then you look back and you're like, I don't remember which one was which. And you can see um, I've got create site, duplicate site, introductions, test, probably not a great name. Um, you know, what am I testing? But just, you know, just always be more explicit with your names than you feel like you should make it seem like you're talking to somebody who's never been to earth and has no idea what's going on. All right, so register user. I like this because I can control all aspects of the registration process and I can use this to register users even if on the network settings, I've turned user registration off and site creation off. This will do that even if that stuff is shut down. So that's something to know. Um, you know, one pattern you might do is have user registration through Gravity Forms and allow any registered user to create sites. So you can mix and match the patterns and where people do things kind of as it fits your method and model. Um, so one of the cool things about Gravity Forms is you can like I said, customize kind of all aspects of this process. You can cut it up into pages. You can do stuff with HTML interspersed. You can do that with user registration in WordPress, but it's a lot more involved in the way that you're altering the template pages. And it's, it's just a bit harder and you know can feel kind of kludgy because it's not really made for you to do that. Um, and this, you're kind of investing some time and energy in learning gravity forms, but it's a lower bar technically. And I think that there's a lot more built-in sophistication. Like here too, we can control the email uh, communication and we can make multiple emails happen at different levels. We can make them HTML rich. We can do a confirmation message afterwards. We can redirect after the submission. We can do all that stuff. And those skills apply outside of this particular process. So it's kind of helping you. Um, and it's certainly a nice step into starting to customize things without having to become full on PHP programmer, right? So if we look at what I've got going on here, we've just got a couple of fields. Uh, notice I have an HTML block. Um, you know, this again, it's not optimal in terms of how you write this HTML, but you can write the HTML and intersperse it in the form. And we'll take a quick look at what this looks like at the moment by doing the preview. But I can say things uh, maybe at the right time, like before choosing your username, realize you have these choices. This is going to impact this. If you were trying to talk through like internet privacy and pseudonymity, <laughs> which is a fun word to say, um, you know, this is where you can do some of that. Clearly, you'd want to do a better job in this. You could intersperse pictures. You could have links to uh, additional content. You know, you could really think through like, how are we trying to educate people so that when they get their account. They've been fully informed. This is also a great place to uh, denote kind of the like the community standards to indicate with a checkbox or something that they're agreeing to this process. All that stuff can be integrated in here pretty easily. Um, and you just want to make sure in this case you're getting the basics. So we probably want the first and last names. We're choosing a username, a password, and an email. And you can see that these are fields uh, that are available in a couple different ways. So we've got our name, got our username, um, we have email, got our password. So we're just dragging those things over. And 
you can also take advantage of, of the other options that are available in Gravity Forms. Like if you wanted to have them choose whether they're a student or a faculty member, um, this is a great place to add that sort of information. And it becomes part of the Gravity Forms uh, log, which you can access via an API. You could also get a little fancier and have it be a, an aspect of the profile. Uh, and write that stuff in some sort of customized way. We won't get into that today because we have a lot of stuff to go over uh, still, but this is the general process that you can create um, for registration. It certainly doesn't apply if you're doing single sign-on, um, but if you're doing that, you're customizing maybe how you register for a site. Maybe you're, you know, you're just thinking through like, What's our process? How are we handing off to different things that we control so that we can kind of shape things in the way that we want? And this is a pretty decent way to shape things. And let's take a look at, at kind of what that does. So because we turned on user registration under settings here, it's available as an option. Here's our user registration feed. And what we do is we map things right so i am creating a user i've got that one checked you could also create a process that updates users you know if you wanted to <laughs> that could be awesome especially if you aren't doing single sign-on for letting folks change um names or or nicknames or whatever to um at, yeah that's a big one yeah. that comes up yeah and it lets you guide that process and maybe put some stoppers, put some additional information again in ways that doing it via the traditional WordPress methods just don't. Um, so just keep, keep in mind, this is a builder for interactions that I can shape a lot more uh, to my case and based on where I'm seeing problems. Uh, so all this is doing is you're just kind of mapping stuff together. It's a little bit like mail merge. So my username thing is doing this, my first name and last names. Uh, and notice some of these are required, but others aren't. You can make people have particular roles um, when they're registering, um, all that sort of thing. And, and also you have the ability to do meta uh, keys, which are, you know, there's some default ones and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff here because I have a giant um, multi-site that, that gets beyond that. Is but this is still a default user meta? <laughs> I think it is. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you might just force them to have an AIM account um, just because it would be funny. Uh, and then you have these options, right? So it's like I could check this box and create a site as part of this and, um, you know, do it all on this end. So, for instance, if I wanted all sites to be the student username at the URL, um, or a particular th other thing, this is one way to force that. So think about it this way too. This is not necessarily love all, serve all. You can have a generic uh, process like this, but you could have a specific one, say, for a particular course or portfolio pattern where you do want to force things that you don't want to for general users. And so you could give that URL for that particular process to a subset of your users. Um, so you have some real flexibility there. Or if you are, uh, one of the things I used to do a fair amount is like we go to a class and everybody would sign up at once. I don't, I don't love that because that offers certain opportunities for drama. But if I was doing that, I could have a URL that say automatically did the user registration and didn't require an approval and I could publish or unpublish that page as desired. I can do lots of different tricks um, for lots of different audiences here. So just think through when you have that kind of flexibility, um, you can do different things based on different needs. What, um, what about the email stuff? So I'm, I'm seeing checkboxes for sending email on registration and stuff like that. Does that conflict or anything with WordPress's own default? Like, do you need to go turn them off at the multi-site level or they'll get two or anything like that? You can control that here and you okay. don't have to do it at the multi-site level. Um, 
And a lot of times what I will do is set notifications and use these instead of the network ones because I have so much more control over these. So these notifications, one, I can have something happen and send to me. Two, I could, like in this process, let's say we're not going to allow the user creation until it's approved by somebody. There's a lot of different reasons you might do that. Um, in this case, I can let them know, hey, when the form submit it, send the email to the person who submitted it. I can have a from name. I can also have a from email. And then this is pretty slick is that I can have a reply to email. You know, that's a thing that often gets missed is, you know, you can make it feel one way here and this reply email might be something gross. Like say your support um, email is like a long thing that isn't affiliated with your domain. Then the reply to is a great place to put that. So it feels, you know, like it's coming from something official, even if this reply to email is a little bit off and weird seeming. So you can kind of switch things up to create a certain feel for this. It's also, I always like pointing out anytime you have, see a from email box that you can, you know, put anything in there, but your success on spam delivery will depend on what you put in there. So if you, um, there are a lot of ways around it. There are DNS ways and IT involved ways with SMTP and things. But one really easy way if you're having trouble getting email delivered is to just use something that isn't your school's domain as a from email, like, you know, in the using like Rampages as an example, that's not at VCU's domain name, that's rampages.us. And that does make the email situation a little bit uh, easier, honestly, in, in some ways. Um, yeah. And Gravity Forms tries to warn you too. <laughs> it's like, hey, this might be a problem. You might want the email to match the domain. Um, so it's something to think about, something to think about in terms of, you know, what that email even does at the domain level. Um, but here we get into, hey, what can you do here? So I can get, I can do all the stuff I want to do. So I have the merge variables that Gravity Forms gives me, you know, that's in this drop down box. So anything submitted by that and other fancy things. I don't think I have any use for most of them in this particular message, but it's good to know that thing exists. Um, and then I can get in here and use the WYSIWYG editor to do quite a bit of stuff. Uh, do keep in mind, though, that emails, HTML email is kind of limited in certain ways. Like you can't use external style sheets. The more complex you make this thing, the more likely it's not going to look the way you want. There are whole people who specialize in worrying about like writing HTML emails. It's like a weird subcraft, like, I don't know, uh, creating miniature uh, dill pickles. It's, it's a, a weird, <laughs> yeah, strange people, strange stuff. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing that. But generic things you can do here really nicely. Um, you get a very different look um, with the email that gets sent. And I think because I am using my WP local for my dev environment, it has kind of a cool thing that can help you here as you're trying to figure this stuff out. Um, so this is my environment that I run here to test things. And under tools, it has this thing called mail hog. And so I can open mail hog and I can see um, emails that are being sent out um, and go through and kind of go like, oh, what do these things look like? And here's my thanks for signing up email. And you can see that stuff is coming through in a nice HTML -y way. Uh, not perfect, but much better than just plain text, I think. So you have some of those options. You can do some cool stuff. Um, and MailHog, this used to be like super hard. You had to set up a whole like crazy thing internally to make this work. But now with WP Local, which I think WP Engine owns now, 
you can see the different emails and really start to understand what's going on in these communication patterns. So that can be really nice and useful. So just keep that in mind. Awesome. Um, all right. So we're 43 minutes in. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to, we're going to put that on the a burner. We can do redirects. We can do a lot of different stuff off of this. So just consider that tip of the iceberg pointing at potential options. We could pass people off now to another thing that lists say, hey, if we knew they were faculty, we could shift them into a page that lays out, I don't know, projects, faculty uh, portfolio sites, gives them a hint of what they might want to think through and provide some examples and then allows them to create a site subsequently. Same thing with students. Or we could have a part of the student drop down that's like, are you involved in which site, uh, which course? And then route them through to a course site where they do something different, including now that we got you as a user, you're registered, and we don't want you to create your own site. We just want you to join this site. We could make that an automated process through Gravity Forms, maybe with some customization, or we could have it be kind of a secondary thing where they, since they're a user, they go to the site, and there are some plugins that allow you to join a site um, based on how you activate that particular plugin. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes so to speak which plugin that is i believe boone made it uh way back in the day um but it definitely exists i think it's called join my multi-site or something like that um the uh the other thing i like here too you, you mentioned you know suggesting different use cases or plugins or themes or whatever for say students or faculty again i you know think i would i would do that on some kind of landing page somewhere Right. Say building on my thing before docs.stateu slash, you know, faculty. And you can mention that in the form and then email them about it later too. Like, remember that thing? Here's here's a page where you can look at it more if you want to. Um, having that stuff be at a publicly visible URL that folks can revisit and you can email to them so that they remember it is going you're gonna find more success, I think with folks finding that useful. So. Well, that, you, you mentioned something that I was kind of thinking about the other day, both in terms of domain of one's own and uh, a scenario like this. It's like, wouldn't it be cool if I see they registered on date X and then I realize seven days have passed and they haven't logged back in or changed anything. Can I email them like a thing that's like, hey, just noticed you know, it's that kind of like just reaching out and feels kind of human and saying like, do you need some help? Do you need some guidance? Do you want me to delete the domain of one's own account? You know, all of those things would be like a nice touch point and, you know, kind of keep me from having to, one, maybe it keeps the person engaged and two, it keeps me from keep wasting resources um, that are just going to be abandoned for a whole year because, and maybe I solicit feedback, like, why'd you close? You know, why don't you want it? Maybe I asked for that. So there's some really nice communication patterns you can set up. And that data is going to live in different places. And you can query it in different ways, but definitely doable. And I think really advantageous. And then you double down by those great URL kind of patterns you're talking about and where the documentation lives. And you start to feel like, hey, <laughs> this isn't a, you know, this isn't a jerry-rigged operation. We're like professionals, um, you know, and it becomes just a very, it's a nice feeling, I think, that you can give people and you can get and in, in stuff like that. All right, let's, uh, let's hop over here. Um, so you can see the dashboard can look a little cramped, right? So we've got, in our case, a little domain of one's own data in there, which I like because I wanted it there. Um, but for different sites, let me go someplace. And I didn't network activate this because I didn't want it to happen everywhere, but I'm going to go to this dashboard and I'm going to turn on a plugin that, that I like because it starts to make, again, we have this dashboard. Can we make it... 
can we make it something that's a little more functional? So I might activate this on the WordPress multi-site at the network level, and look what I've done. The dashboard, which people come to all the time, is usually just this chaotic mess that everyone ignores. No one is customizing it, you know, <laughs> like that's just not what happens. So you can do something with a plugin that cleans everything up and puts in what you want. In this case, I'm just doing a little bit of Swedish love with the Karlstadt University logo. Um, and then what this one does is it looks at the root site uh, of our WordPress multi-site and pulls in any posts that's tagged with support or categorized as support. Um, and it just displays it there. And I think I have a limit of five and it's just a regular WordPressy thing. So. You know, it's just a way to turn this page into something more. You could provide updates of different kinds here. You can really think through what do I want this space to look like and how do I customize it? And we'll take a quick look at what that looks like on the programming side. Because again, this is a nice kind of basic thing. It's not too aggressive um, in terms of what it's doing. Um, Let's take a look at what's going on here. So this is how we get rid of stuff. <laughs> and all we're doing is I'll turn one on right now. So I'll comment that one out. And this is dashboard activity. And I'll refresh it. And all of a sudden we have dashboard activity. It's amazing how that automatically makes this thing feel so much busier, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a very yeah. messy feeling thing. And I don't know anyone really that uses this. So what you can do, to figure out how to make stuff go away, because different plugins may have other stuff here. So what I've done is I went through and removed a bunch of the default WordPress ones. And I'll show you also, I removed some from other things. But if you inspect this thing here, you can kind of see what the thing is called by this ID, dashboard activity. See it right there? So if we look back at what I made go away, it's this right here. And it's part of dashboard normal core. And also notice that there's dashboard side core. So it may take a little bit of messing around to figure out what the pattern is for the particular thing. But, you know, it's there's not a whole lot of options in this. And you can see activity right now, comments, site health, I think is just scary for people because it's none of your business. And WordPress multi-site, I'm going to worry about that. You, you don't need to worry about site, site health. Um, and I can do that. And you notice also I undid some things like I think this is a buddy press thing, Yoast, Gravity Forms. So you can do all that and just remove the pieces you don't want. And also notice, look, I did good comments to actually <laughs> say what this was. I should have done this up here, too. But, you know, like I said, over comment, make sure you're detailing the stuff that you want. So this alone gets rid of all the stuff. And then this little chunk up here is how you add a chunk. So you got an action called WP dashboard setup. We're going to run this particular function. This is the function where we're going to add a dashboard widget. And this is going to be the name. And that's a little bit of ugly HTML that I would probably do in a different way. I'd probably reference template file these days. Um, but, you know, it shows you that even if you have no idea what you're doing, you can still get stuff done. It's just maybe not as pretty or elegant as, uh, as, as you might in the future. Yeah. I I've done a custom dashboard widget that was the ugly way and it, it works, you know, it's, right. I love the idea of pulling in posts though, because that's so much easier to update you know for anyone you don't have to <laughs> hey we need to put a message out to our users it's like all right go someone go update the custom plugins like no just make a new post that's that's brilliant also i'll just say for the color commentary that i'm here for dashboard normal core is my favorite punk subgenre so <laughs> um, 
Well, uh, at the next Reclaim uh, conference, we'll see if we can get a band together. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is kind of interesting in terms of just looking at like what you can do when you're in WordPress multi-site. Because what this query does is you see it switches to blog with ID 1. And then it runs the query as if you were in that blog. Um, that's really with, interesting because you could make a hidden blog, right? right? Theoretically, you could use any blog and not even be a public page because it's querying from WordPress itself. So right, if you right. wanted it to work that way. Yeah, lots of neat tricks. And this is the PHP way. I don't know these days if I might not do it with JavaScript and the, you know, the API and then just plop it in that way. There's a million different ways to do this sort of stuff and deciding what it is you want to do is kind of both the beauty and the challenge. So because, again, I'm saying this is round two, this is less about here's the way and more about here's your opportunity to customize. Here's your way to think about this. And there are lots of different things. Maybe you don't want to learn much PHP. You want to focus on JavaScript. Great. There's a different way to approach this that would lead you to a different language, but you have a lot of flexibility. You have a lot of choice, do different things based on what you want. Um, All right. One, what, yeah. will, will, we be able, will we be able to link to this? You have this yeah, sure, sure, someplace? sure. Yeah, this yeah. Really it's, cool. Yeah, it's a fun one. It's an easy one. Again, not a complex thing. Like you can just get in here and bang around on stuff and try things. And again, have that local development environment so that you can tweak stuff. See what happens. Maybe you break the site for a little bit. That'd be awesome. Try and break it. It's just a dev environment. You won't, you know, worse things worse, you destroy a dev environment. I've done that before. I've lost one that, you know, it's a little bit of a hassle, but it's no big deal. All right. So before, before we go, I have a whole five minutes to talk about cloning stuff. All right. So. In this case, I'm going to use an example, right? It's not a fully formed thing. I've gotten it working before. It involves NS Cloner, and sometimes that can be really wonky in different environments um, for different reasons. But I want to show you kind of a conceptual idea that I think is interesting um, and that, that, that does, does, I think, something kind of cool. Because a lot of what we're trying to do is walk people through like, hey, here's a cool idea. Or in this class, you're going to use this. We want to get you started really fast. That may be choosing a particular theme, having particular plugins activated, or provisioning really default content, or maybe all three of those things. So how do you do that? How do you do that in a way that's both uh, perhaps educational and that helps you understand what's going on? In this case, uh, I have a, a custom post type I made called clone. All right. So I'm going to look at it in classic editor because I'm an old, old man. Um, and it really is just doing a couple things here. I could write some text here that describes what this is. Uh, I put the site URL in so we know what to copy. And then you see this stuff getting written down here. These are all the copies that get made at that page. And by default, it sets the display to false, um, but you can come through and make them public by saying true. But it gives me a URL of the thing, the name of the thing, stuff like that, um, so that I'll be able to track it. Now, again, this was made to go with a particular theme, so this is going to be kind of ugly, right, <laughs> clearly. So I don't have the thumbnail in here. I think I do for, let's look at another one. Uh, yeah, I think I have for this one. So there we've got our featured. We have a little description. We have some example sites not showing up at the moment, but let's say we wanted this. So we can say clone it. And this is pulling up the gravity form. It's selecting that. I would hide this source um, if this was a functional thing, but it just shows you that it's picking a particular item out of this. Uh, I can give it a name. Uh, let's call it. All right. I'll hit submit. And this is where 
will probably have a little bit of an error. But what it's doing is it's gravity forms is contacting NS cloner. Look at our URL. Mm. Hey, it made it. It applied a particular theme. It copied the content over it, activated whatever plugins were activated, all using NS cloner and gravity forms. So, um, you know, it's it's the start of, of I think, a really powerful thing because you can direct people to particular pages. You can allow them to create these clones on their own. You can keep track of what clones have been created and show additional examples and how things were tweaked. And what it takes advantage of is, where is our NS cloner stuff? There is NS cloner documents kind of this, this process, you know, this function that needs to run and what information it needs. Um, and that's what gravity forms is provisioning. It's, you know, saying, all right, what's the clone mode? What source ID is it? And Gravity Forms is saying the ID of the blog on the network. What's the name? What's the title? Um, and then it does it. Now, there are lots of different issues with this particular plugin. Like, what does it do on errors that are kind of hard to suss out? Like, if you try and duplicate to a URL that already exists, what happens? Where does that error show up? So like that, that stuff has not been, you know, kind of well, well figured out in part because NS Cloner keeps changing over time. But maybe you don't use NS Cloner. Maybe you do some other stuff, you know, uh, just brainstorming earlier. We were talking about you can get the plugins that are active for a particular site. It's really just a, an entry in the database table and copy that to a new place. You can figure out what theme it is, same deal. You can turn that on. The content gets a little bit messier. Um, and, you know, in particular, certain plugins create whole table structures and knowing that that happened is also trickier, like H5P might be a good example. So there's some complexity there and it would work better in certain scenarios than others, but like this isn't an impossible or even super complex problem to solve if you set some limits on what you expect from it. And if you have a pretty constrained pattern here, you know, so it's just thinking about what am I going to get advantages of for this particular process? What do I really want to get done? And then maybe I'm not trying to be able to clone anything in the world. I'm just trying to be able to clone these things because I do that regularly. So what are my limitations? Maybe I don't worry about content at all. Maybe I do the import XML thing, which I could trigger functionally, you know, using the traditional WordPress importer. I don't know, but trying to figure out like, what's the easiest path for me and my process? The reason it's so hard for plugin developers like NS cloners, they're trying to solve the problem for everyone in all scenarios. So here, just kind of limit things to your scenario and it becomes more approachable, more solvable. There. Yeah, that's awesome. 1001. <laughs> Not bad. Not terrible. I think we started a little late, but yeah. Yeah. This, this was great. Yeah. And, and a lot and of stuff. A lot of stuff. Definitely a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, so we are, you know, going to be back with week three uh next week <laughs> next week is week three um and yeah any closing thoughts taylor before we head out um no just uh make sure to look up dashboard normal core on Bandcamp and um and and i would encourage folks in a serious way <laughs> to you know these patterns these workflows right um that we're encouraging you to think about I'm sure you have thoughts or questions as you're saying, how does this apply to my situation? Please put that in the Discord because yeah. I think even thinking through that out loud um, is helpful. It's helpful for me to see for, for helping people, but I think other schools, other people will find it useful to say like, ah, yeah, it applies in this way to this school. Um, seeing those permutations I think is really useful and helpful. So ask questions or say, I'm gonna implement it like this um, we want to see that stuff. So thanks. 
Yeah, uh, please, please. Re- any any interactions, I would appreciate. Any questions, you know, we like help me make this stuff useful for you. Yeah, and we we'll, we will have the off like set office hours time later this week, but um, that doesn't mean that's the only time that you can post in Discord. You can post at any time. So we look forward to hearing from you all. And uh, thank you again, Tom. Thanks, Taylor, for joining. And see you next week.